Good evening. Greetings. I'm Sandra Edmonds Crew, um, Dean of the Howard University School of Social Work. Thank you all for attending this evening. The School of Social Work is so very excited to have you join us this evening for our annual intellectual sit-in for social justice featuring Professor Nicole Hannah Jones, renowned journalist and scholar. As you know, we are also celebrating Black History Month. So let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> The intellectual sit-in builds upon the tradition of social justice activism here at Howard University. This symbolic sit-in represents our intentionality in social work education that builds upon the black perspective and its six principles, affirmation, strengths, diversity, social justice, vivification, and internationalization. Now, I could have had my students just rattle those off for me. <laughs> The first intellectual sit-in occurred in April 2021 with Dr. John Jacob and Dr. Mitt Joyner, the John and Barbara Jacob Endowed Professor. In his conversation, Dr. Jacob reminded us of our responsibility to get up every day and do something to promote social justice in this country. Tonight, I am also lifting the legacy of Dr. Annabelle Burns Lindsay, the founding dean of our school. She was a tireless champion for social justice in the profession of social work. Dean Lindsay's sociocultural uh, perspective informed social work practice across the country. Uh, she was a, truly a legend. She insisted that the Howard University School of Social Work be second to none. Additionally, I elevate Dr. Lucy Diggs Slow, who was also a champion of social justice and was an early advocate for Howard University offering a social work degree. The undergraduate library where we are this evening sits at the corner of the newly named street, Lucy Diggs Slow Way. At the dedication of this street in October, I stated that here at the Howard University School of Social Work, we have always stood on the shoulders of D Lucy Diggs Slow, and now we get to stand upon her street. I am so honored to have special guests this evening uh, who have agreed the, the, uh, with the importance of this moment. Uh, Mrs. Patricia Walters, who donated her coveted collection of black art to Howard University to support the Dr. Ronald Walters Chair for Race and Black Politics. As many of you know, Dr. Ronald Walters was also the chair of the Political Science Department here at Howard University. And he organized the first student sit-in in the nation. He was a young man when he did this in Wichita, Kansas. And he really uh, started his career understanding the importance of social justice in 1958 at the Dockham Drug Store in Wichita, Kansas. Mrs. Walters is also an advocate in her own right for social justice. For years, we worked together side by side as social workers for the Housing Opportunities Commission in Montgomery County, Maryland. Additionally, we have Dr. Andrew Billingsley and Mrs. Amy Billingsley joining us this evening. Dr. Billingsley is considered by many the father of the black perspective here at Howard University. Among his notable scholarly contributions is climbing Jacob's Ladder and the enduring legacy of African American families. In 1992, Dr. Billingsley. So we are also joined by Dr. Annie Brown, retired faculty member who made outstanding contributions to our school, including co-authoring the book with Dr. Ruby Gordine on Howard University and the School of Social Work in the 1970s. I believe Dr. Billingsley wrote the uh, a preface for that particular book or the dedication for that book. So you can see that we are inextricably linked here at Howard University. She is also joined by her guest, Mrs. Stanford, and so we're so glad to have her here tonight. 
So we are joined by the, also the faculty and the staff of the School of Social Work, as well as other PhD students. So we're so pleased to have you. So tonight, I have been joined by two first year PhD students to lead the sit-in with Professor Hannah Jones. Bazell Taylor is currently a first year doctoral student at Howard University School of Social Work. Bazell is a policy subcommittee member of the Texas Southern University Center for uh, Justice Research Police Reform Advisory Group. Bazell has experience working in nonprofit leadership, higher education, and legislative and community support. Bazell, that's Bazell. <laughs> also, I have Jalisa Worthy, uh, who is a first-year PhD student at Howard University School of Social Work. Prior to beginning her doctoral studies, she served as the project director of Sure Way to College, a Maryland Next Generation Scholars Program. Jalissa is a Comunidad and Umoja Scholars Fellow, initiating exploration of her research interests in social cognition and higher education access in rural communities. Please now allow me to introduce Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones. I, uh, I will also share with you her biographical profile. But I would also take, like to take a moment to say special appreciation to Howard University, to the libraries of Howard University. Uh, Mr. Watkins, thank you so much uh, for uh, permitting us to use this space and making it a wonderful space for this. So let me share for a moment Nicole Hannah Jones's bio, which is much too short, but in, so that you can hear directly from here, her, I will give you the shortened version of this. Before I do that, I'd also like to induce, introduce my decanal colleague, uh, Dr. Gracie Lawson Bordas, who is the dean of the um, School of Communication, Kathy Hughes School of Communications. Nicole Hannah Jones is the Pulitzer Prize winning creator of the 1619 Project and staff writer at the New York Times Magazine. She has spent her career investigating racial inequality and injustice, and her reporting has earned her the MacArthur Fellowship, known as the Genius Grant, a Peabody Award, two George Polk Awards, and the National Magazine Award three times. Hannah Jones also earned the John Chancellor Award for Distinguished Journalism and was named Journalist of the Year by the National Association of Black Journalists and the News Women's Club of New York. In 2020, she was inducted into Society of American Historians and in 2021 into the North Carolina Media Hall of Fame. Nicole was named as one of the most influential people in, in, the 2021, in 2021 by Time Magazine. In 2016, Hannah Jones co-founded the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigating, Repo Investigative Reporting, which seeks to increase the number of reporters and editors of color. She holds a Master's of Arts in Mass Communication from the University of North Carolina and earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in History and African American Studies from the University of Notre Dame. She is the Knight Chair in Race and Journalism at Howard University, where she has founded the Center for Journalism and Democracy. So before the interviews start, I would like to also recognize uh, Provost Anthony Wuta. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. So now it's in the hands of our distinguished students and their panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Crew. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so first, I just want to out loud say thank you for uh, consistently and unabashedly speaking truth to power. It means a lot to me personally, but to get into our questions, um, most of us have learned lessons and witnessed the impact of the 1619 Project. Uh, but can you discuss your intention behind the work? Uh, who was your intended audience? Uh, what lessons did you learn during both individual and collaborative writing process? Um, and just anything that you can share with us about that. That was a lot, huh? That was, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> In journalism, we teach you to break that down into separate questions. See, we got, we got a lot to learn. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming tonight. I, I just have to correct the record. I, I'm not Dr. Nicole Hannah-Jones. I have no doctorate that I earned, just the honorary ones. Um, so just call me Nicole. That's fine. Sure. Um, so I, I, I do appreciate the upgrade of my credentials, <laughs> I was about to say. It looks nice up there, but I don't think I'm ever going back to get it. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Doctorate other people, maybe. Um, <laughs> I like that. Now I already forgot your question. Uh, your intention behind the work, intended uh, audience. So, in some ways, I feel like I've been working towards the creation of the 1619 Project my entire career as a journalist. Um, I got into journalism. I majored in history. I loved history. I, I started studying history really in high school kind of obsessively because once I took this one semester of black studies course, uh, it's like my world changed. I, I realized that we had been getting a history that was this narrow when there was all of this stuff happening on the margins that actually involved people who look like me that we hadn't been taught about. And so I just wanted to learn more and more. And the more I learned about uh, the history involving black Americans, the more the world started to make sense, a world that didn't really make sense to me. Um, I was nerdy as a child, and I would notice that the way we were portrayed in popular media didn't match what I saw in my own communities. I saw that people worked hard. I knew that people wanted good schools for their kids. I knew that everything that every other community wanted, we wanted, but we seemed to struggle to get it, and the explanations that society was giving about why we didn't have those things just didn't match the reality. So um, once I started studying history, then I understood that there was this reality was constructed, right. that the reason that black Americans faced disadvantage was not about personal choices. It was about these structures that had been put in place. So when I decided to be a journalist, I always knew I had to wed history with my journalism, that in a country that I say has nationalized amnesia when it comes to the legacy of slavery, um, the legacy of anti-blackness, that you couldn't write about racial inequality in the present without explaining how we got here um, in the past. So I used to joke with my editors that all my work was eventually going to get us back to 1619. And he would, he would joke with me about how my essays were getting longer and longer and longer, and that's because I was building in earlier and earlier history. And when the 400th anniversary of um, 1619 was approaching, I was obsessing once again about how this really foundational date, the advent of slavery, African slavery in the original 13 colonies was approaching, and yet most Americans still had never heard of the date 1619. And that, that was part of this legacy of erasure, um, erasure of how foundational slavery was to our founding and the country that would develop, an erasure of black contributions, an erasure of the black freedom struggle as part of the, the larger uh, American project. And I wasn't in high school anymore. I was working at the New York Times, the biggest megaphone really in the world. And I just decided that I was going to use this 400th anniversary uh, to try to force some type of reckoning with what it meant that slavery is older than almost anything else in our country. And um, I knew it couldn't just be a single essay. If you're going to try to tell a 400-year story, it has to be big. And even as big as it is, it's not even you know an iota of, of what could be told. And I knew it couldn't just be about the past, that every you know black people here many, many times in our lives that slavery was a long time ago. Right. Why don't you get over it? as if slavery is not something we want to get over more than anyone else, right? It doesn't benefit us. Um, and so I, I wanted to show that we can't get over slavery because our country hasn't gotten over slavery. Our country has not dealt with slavery. Our country has not dealt with the legacy of slavery. And so it had to be a project that was looking at the present, um, but explaining the present through the lens of this foundational American institution that we've treated as a asterisk. So that was really um, the impetus for the project. And the audience is always an a interesting question because clearly I know who the typical audience of the New York Times is. 
the typical audience of the New York Times is whiter than the country and is wealthier than the country. Uh, it's not representative. It's certainly not my folks at home who to this day don't read the New York Times. <laughs> I think the 1690 Project was the first thing I've ever written that most of my, my family has actually read. Um, so I knew who the audience was, and I, I was, so I, I would not pretend that I was not creating a project that I knew would be consumed by a large number of people who are not the descendants of American slavery. But I always say I was writing the project two and four, two different groups. And um, I was writing it two, all Americans, New York Times, anyone, but I was writing it for black descendants right. of American slavery. And it was the four that guided the process, not the two. And I think that's important because a lot of times, too often, we see this with black movies, we see this with, with black projects that try to be mainstream, is then you have to uh, cut off the harsh edges of it. You have to make it palatable. You don't want to make people too uncomfortable. And if we were going to tell this story, then it had to be unflinching. You couldn't be worried about uh, whether the main consumer of the New York Times was going to be put off by it. Um, it had to be as truthful as possible. And that means you had to tell about all the barbarism, all the atrocities, uh, but also all the ways that black people resisted, black people fiercely asserted their humanity. So the two was, I would hope anybody who was interested um, and having a more honest reckoning with our, with our country, but the four was, was for black people, and particularly black descendants of slavery. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you. So you only get to get through like four of those questions. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I was like, that's so cute. They have all those questions, because I talk a lot, no. sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. And we were trying to gauge that, like which, you know. It's how, how... always good to be over-prepared, so yeah. we'll, we'll get through as many as we can. Wonderful. Well, you kind of already went into this question a little bit, um, but maybe you can parse it out a little bit more for us. But in the book, you kind of talked about the framing being the reason why there was some pushback to the project in the first place, um, particularly like centralizing slavery and anti-blackness to the formation of the United States as a nation. Um, can you talk about just a little bit about the particular framing and why that was essential, um, and maybe why some of the public is directly connecting that to critical race theory? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, one, I think the framing is just accurate. I, I would imagine anybody in here who's read any scholarship on America that is five, you know, five decades old or newer knows that the, the arguments in the 1619 Project are not radical at mm -hmm. all. Um, in fact, the critique from the left is that they're not, like, progressive enough, right? Um, so I just don't know how an accurate and dispassionate understanding of our history does not put slavery at the center. It just, it just defies what we know. Uh, the, the English landed Jamestown in 1607. It only takes 12 years to engage in African slavery. Uh, by the 1640s, we've already codified African slavery. By 1776, one-fifth of our population is enslaved. It's not incidental that the man who wrote the Declaration was an enslaver, the man who's the father of the Constitution was an enslaver, the man who wrote the Bill of Rights was an enslaver, the first president, 10 of the first 12 presidents. Virginia was the oldest, wealthiest, largest of the colonies. Like None of these things um, are anything but just facts. And we're taught to center the North, Philadelphia, Boston, both slave ports, by the way, um, as the ideological like heart of America. Uh, but Virginia was the actual heart of America, and you can't really argue otherwise. So to me, what, is, what the response is coming from is we all know from the moment you take a breath, we're indoctrinated into the mythology of America. The mythology of America, the scrappy colonists who wanted freedom had to break off from the British Empire to found the freest, greatest nation in the history of the world, and that capitalism is the freest and best economic system in the history of the world. And if you acknowledge that we were actually just another slave colony, um, that we were 
uh, hypoc more hypocritical than any of those other colonies because they didn't pretend to be based on ideas of freedom, and we did, and that capitalism here was actually based on uh, the antithesis of freedom, it was based on forced labor, then you have to totally um, alter your concept of what it means to be an American. And for people who their entire life have been invested in that mythology, that is a very deeply unsettling thing. And that's why I spend a great deal of my time in the preface talking about what is history. Well, history is, of course, what, were, uh, what happened on what date and who did it. History happened. But then commonly history is what are we taught about what happened? on what day and what did it. And that is a project of curation. That is a project of manipulation. That is a project where uh, powerful people in order um, to create this shared sense of national identity are shaping what we know, what we think about who we are as a past. And this country, or excuse me, this project was trying to uh, throw that off as axes, right? Mm -hmm. To trouble the master's narrative and uh, to say that that's not actually who we are. It was, it was designed to pierce that mythology. Uh, power is always going to respond to that. I mean, if the project hadn't been popular, power wouldn't have cared about it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if it weren't in the New York Times, I think there would have been a very different reaction to it um, than, than what there was. But it, because it became so popular, because it started moving into classrooms, uh, because during the protest movement following George Floyd's um, lynching, um, you began to see 1619 and that 400 year legacy being evoked, then there had to be a response. And of course, conservatives went to the oldest wedge issue in America, which is race and racism. And uh, this project has gotten caught up in that. Thank you. So when we go to your website, the very first thing you see is uh, you, you outline in detail that the mission of your work is confronting hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. um, so critical race theory accesses social workers to move from blaming the victim to analyzing, and I say being critical of the systems um, that, that really harm our communities. Uh, practicing radical social work and even abolition in social work is, I think, tied in there. Um, could you share advice for those of us who take part in that charge of confronting hypocrisy um, when we take on what critical race theory asks us to do? Mm. Well, I, I never try to advise people in profession outside of my own expertise, <laughs> but I'm still going to offer some advice. So. <laughs> Um, which actually, I, I guess I didn't answer the second part of your question either. Uh, of course, uh, the 1619 Project has been accused of being critical race theory. Uh, I argue it's not critical race theory, though certainly my work is informed by critical race theory because to me critical race theory is just understanding the reality of the United States. Um, I have two books at home that are just about race in U.S. law. They're two Bibles thick. I mean, everything from who can testify in a court to what door you could use, to whether you could use a phone booth or not, um, to parking spaces for black people and white people. I mean, every part of our society was structured around um, race and particularly anti-blackness and ensuring that black people's lives were not just constrained but demeaned in every possible way. And then you can look at Supreme Court rulings, a vast history of this country. The Supreme Court has ruled against black rights, against the uh, protection of civil rights. You can look at our Constitution. You can look at our amendments. I mean, I, I don't know how one argues that our legal system was not shaped in almost every way uh, around race. I mean, even something like Citizens Involved, which uses the 14th Amendment, which the 14th Amendment, of course, uh, is the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution passed after the end of slavery, um, where then corporations get citizenship as black people get citizenship, which tells you a lot about America, right? Um, so to me, to not look at the world through the United States through a lens of critical race theory is to not look at the United States. I don't know how one argues otherwise. Um, an example that I give to regular people who, I mean, this is, this is why we're not taught an accurate history because I, 
I say in some ways the 1619 Project and the works that the 1619 Project are based upon are like taking the red pill in the matrix. This is a, a more mature crowd, so y'all probably seen the matrix. When I say this to younger college students, they have no idea what I'm, what I'm talking about, and that's when you realize you really actually are getting old. Um, but it is like taking the red pill. So you have this reality and you have no idea what created it. You don't see the architecture, the coding behind it. And critical race theory to me provides the coding of how it's built. Um, and it's hard for people to understand, but the, the easiest, and I know y'all understand because y'all are studying this, but the easiest uh, analogy I can give is, is redlining. So the government sits down and in every major city, it marks up communities based on um, risk, right? And decides that communities that are black or integrated or have a lot of a certain type of immigrants are high risk, but mostly if they're black or if they have black people in them. And they mark up these maps and they redline black areas and those areas can't get home loans. Um, that leads to a whole bunch of cascading effects, property values decrease, not because black people have moved in, but because literally black people living there means the government will value their properties lower. Um, it forces white people who don't mind if they live around black people to move because they can't get loans on their homes either. So then that leads to more segregation. Then in 1968, we get the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which says redlining is illegal, but no one changes the map. So all these years later, I can be white, not racist at all, but the system is still in place. So property values are still based on those old redlining maps. Whether you can get a loan, uh, the same house in a black neighborhood is worth sometimes five times less than in a white neighborhood, exact same structure, all because of those redlining maps. Banks can uh, still prey on those neighborhoods because they have been under Lent, and it has nothing to do with racism. These are not even individuals who are doing racist things, but the structure is in place. And if you don't undo the structure, it self-replicates. Um, this is what critical race theory helps, tries to help us understand. And in the same way, this is what the 1619 Project is trying to help us understand, that you can't have 350 years of effort, legal effort, political effort, scientific effort, artistic effort, all going towards creating a system of racial caste that disadvantages black people in every way and advantages white people in every way. Not that every white person is advantaged, but within their social class, they're always advantaged over black people, right? You can't have all of that and then say, okay, we passed these laws, it's no longer legal to do any of that and then pretend that that entire infrastructure goes away. The only way the infrastructure goes away is to put the same amount of resources into undoing it. But why would the people who created all of that to benefit them put in that amount of effort to undo it? So to me, when you want to understand any social problem in America, I don't understand how you cannot look through it um, without having a critical race lens. It doesn't explain everything. Um, but if you don't use that lens, you're not going to get to it. Right. And that to me is, I mean, when I first read Derrick Bell, uh, when I first read Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, Ian Henny Lopez, I mean, that's when you start, again, it's like you realize, I'm not crazy. Right. I'm not paranoid. The system actually is working this way, but the difference is, a belief that is working that way, and now you have the language. Mm -hmm. Now you can make the argument. And that to me is the danger of the 1619 Project. That's the danger of critical race theory, mm -hmm. is they don't want you to be able to make the tactical argument about the society. Because if you look at, I, I've spent a lot of time um, looking at the polling and kind of why, I mean, critical race theory, I mean, the fact that every person says that term now is crazy to me. Like. Y'all know this. A year ago, most people, unless you were academic, no one knew what that was. Right. Even most academics didn't know what that was. Exactly. And promise me, teachers who can't even do a good lecture on slavery, right, who are doing like mock slave auctions, are not over here teaching critical race theory. We wish they were, right? Like we wish they were actually giving their students the knowledge to make a structural critique. They're not. Um, 
but you can trace the rise on Fox News. It literally begins to happen at the end of 2020 with the Black Lives Matter protests and with the election, right? And when Biden wins, you just see this spike and all of a sudden it gets inserted because that's the original wedge issue. But what was happening, the polling in 2020, June, July, August, you were seeing 45% of Republicans saying structural racism was a primary obstacle for black Americans. That's an astounding figure. Almost half of Republicans who are not blaming black inequality on black culture, right. on black individuals, but saying there is something in our society that is fundamentally fair and it stems from a long legacy of racism. There had to be a response to that because we all know narrative drives policy. And if you start having half of even conservatives saying that there is a systemic issue, then they're gonna support policies that address the systemic issue. If you believe black people are responsible for their condition, then you support policies that go along with that view of the world. So there had to be a response, and we've seen it. All those companies who are pledging all the support for Black Lives Matter, you hear nothing. The Biden administration was speaking racial justice language. They were putting racial justice guideline. That's gone. They purged 1619 from all of their stuff. They had it when they first got elected. Mm -hmm. So it's been effective. And instead of us, um, those who understand what critical race theory is, pushing back and saying, there's nothing wrong if kids were learning this. This is what critical race theory is. Instead, we spent so much time trying to say, no one's teaching critical race theory as if it were something wrong with that. Um, and we lost that battle. We allow propaganda to win because talking about race is complicated. Racism is easy. So we Sorry. Should, no, you're good. We just I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Y'all mm -hmm. may be able to tell. That's real. <laughs> it's been a long two years. So in a, in a similar vein, uh, before you hop out of that boat, um, when I was reading the book, one thing that you kind of spoke about that really popped out to me as a social worker is you mentioned how 1619 explains the stinginess of our current safety net programs. But a lot of times when you hear public discourse around economic inequality, we're talking about a livable wage. I know as social workers, that's something that's really important to us. Um, but I was reading and just taking in everything that we were saying. And one thing we know is generational poverty doesn't just go away by increasing somebody's income. Um, you were really clear about that. So can you share a little bit about it with us um, how you conceptualize inclusion of reparations into economic equality for black folks? Mm. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, y'all just gonna have to read the essay. No, I'm playing. Um, so yes, it is, it is true that and of course, 1619, I know I'm speaking to academics, so let me be more precise. Uh, 1619, of course, is just a stand-in for the legacy of slavery. Of course, we can't trace everything literally back to 1619, um, but I do argue that uh, so many of, of the kind of defining tensions of uh, American life begin with the institution of African slavery, and that um, so many of the ways we are exceptional in ways we would not want to be exceptional, mm -hmm. which we all know we are the most carceral nation in the world. We have the most inequality of the Western democracies we like to compare ourselves to. Uh, we have the stingiest social safety net, as you were saying. Um, we're the only one of the Western democracies where a woman has a baby and has to go back to work in six weeks. Uh, we're the only one that doesn't provide some form of child care, uh, some form of universal health care. Uh, it only because we've only known a system where you can, whether you can go to the doctor or not depends on whether your employer offers you insurance or not, is diabolical. But we accept it, right? And the polling is very clear. I mean, we saw this with, if you go back to the New Deal, the only way that uh, Roosevelt's able to get the New Deal passed is to exclude black people from some of its most important anti-poverty provisions. and. To this day, when they poll white Americans, the support for social programs declines uh, if, they say, if they believe that large numbers of black people would, will benefit from those programs. Mm -hmm. So look at Medicaid expansion in the South, poorest region of the country, more poor white people than poor black people, 
and yet they will not expand health care because the thought is, which begins literally at the end of slavery, that black people are undeserving. And if you give black people anything, they won't work. So we have a country that will allow large numbers of white Americans to suffer as well because there is an understanding that more black people will suffer. And we don't really care about poor white people either. Poor white people are just convenient when we want to keep down someone else and, may, and the white elite wants to maintain power. So I, um, I hope that my argument for reparations is two-pronged. One, we have a wealthy enough society that we could take care of our poor no matter what their race. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe in this zero-sum game thinking that if black people get something, that means everyone else has to suffer. Um, we have a lot of wealth. You know how we know? This is, this is when I was like, no one can ever argue against reparations again because during the pandemic, we printed money. Mm -hmm. Like, Quick. overnight. Quickly, yeah. Trillions of dollars. Just like that. Mm -hmm. We've always been told we can't expand any of these social safety net programs because we cannot afford it. We pass a military spending bill every year and we printed money overnight to save businesses, mm -hmm. right. largely, during the pandemic, uh, who did not spend that money, as we are finding out, shockingly, um, to actually uh, pay their employees. So I believe that we, c we I support uh, universal health care. I support universal child care. I support debt forgiveness. I support universal college. I don't understand a society that thinks itself as, as a good society, but yet thinks so little of its citizens that we have the money to take care of people who are in need and we won't. But that is a separate issue from reparations. And we have to stop treating reparations as an anti-poverty program. Rep Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Reparations is restitution. Mm -hmm. And reparations to me um, is dealing with the fundamental issue that slavery was not a racist system. Slavery was a system of economic exploitation. And racism is what justified it. And what we benignly call Jim Crow was really racial apartheid. Uh, we love to use euphemisms in this country to soften up um, what we've done. And that was also a system of exploitation. We like to think about drinking fountains, but it was to keep an exploitable class of labor, uh, to try to recreate um, the labor class of slavery as close as possible. So when we look at the black and white wealth gap, which has remained unchanged since the time Dr. King was assassinated, um, unchanged which should be astounding. In 60 years, the gap is not closed whatsoever. And that is with an ascendancy of a black middle class. So you would think the gap would have changed, which tells you if it was just about income, then we would have seen a narrowing of that gap. Mm -hmm. What we know is black people, and, and this is the beauty of having thought about this for so long, is when I, when I constructed my reparations essay, I knew every argument that white people have ever made about why black people should not get reparations, and I answered every single one of those with data. Mm -hmm. If we get married, if we don't have children, if we go to college, if we buy a home, none of those things closes the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. Nothing. There's nothing that black people can do on our own to close a gap that was created by 350 years of racialized plunder. So. Mm -hmm. Even within our class, poor white people have more wealth than middle class black people. A white person with a high school education has more wealth than a black person with a college education. A white single mother has more wealth than a black married mother. So there's nothing that we can do if we did everything quote unquote right, which we shouldn't have to be, right? My friend ta always says, freedom is the ability to be mediocre, right? We shouldn't. <laughs> always have to be exceptional uh, and do everything right to catch up. Uh, so we know that the only thing that can replace the extraction of wealth is a transfer of wealth. And how many of us uh, make the same amount as white colleagues, but we can't move into the neighborhoods that they move into because no one's giving us $50,000 for a down payment on a house. We're paying off student loan debts because our parents couldn't pay for us to go to college. All of these things, uh, accumulate 
And so my argument is just like wealth accumulates over time, very few of us, if we have any wealth, created all that wealth on our own, so does debt. And our country owes a debt. Mm -hmm. And it's actually bad for all of us to have 13% of your population held artificially wealth poor. And that's what black Americans have been. We have been held artificially wealth poor. You either have to believe that we are inferior as a culture or that a system that thought so little of our humanity that they would enslave us for 250 years and force racial apartheid on us for 100 years might be the cause mm -hmm. of our wealth gap. So I argue, of course, for both anti-poverty programs and restitution. And people say, well, should Oprah Winfrey get reparations? Yes. Is she a descendant of American slavery? There's not a wealth test on this if it's restitution. Um, and what she does with that, $70,000 or whatever to her is, I guess, a purse money or something. But um, <laughs> we have a country that could make right by black Americans and, by the way, infuse billions of dollars into the economy. Because what the research also shows, black people save a higher percentage of income than other groups. We just have less money to save. Black people invest more money in their kids' education than white parents do. We just have less money to invest. Black people are the most entrepreneurial of all groups. We just can't hire employees because we don't have enough money to build a big business. So these fears that somehow black folks will go out and buy Gucci, which, I mean, I like nice bags. And trust me, black people are not the ones keeping Gucci in business. Um, what black people will actually do is do the same thing that everyone else that has wealth does, which is what they will invest in community, invest in business, invest in education. So that's my argument. You can read it in the, in the justice essay. Um, but if I have one overarching goal for the project, it is not just to make Americans aware. Uh, it is to make Americans aware and then be forced by that reckoning to do something about the material conditions that makes black lives so hard. So my ultimate goal is to try to move forward on the issue of reparations. Wonderful, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, y'all. No, it's okay. So really we wanted to ask one more question before we open it up to the okay. audience. Um, so a, a great deal of social work operates under what we call micro practice, so working with individuals and families, um, and what, what does that mean? Micro practice. So wor working with in, like uh, clinical social work, uh, therapy, uh, you know, working with with individual people one on one okay. and, and their families. Uh, so I think that we, and we think that that can lead to uh, individualism being centered. And uh, when we think about decision making, it, it there's, there's this tough line that we need to figure out how to draw. Um, but what I wanted you to talk about was your views on education equity um, and school integration and the decision making that black folks, I'm, I'm trying to get my question out because I already know where you're going. Do you? Um, <laughs> I don't even know where I'm going on this issue anymore, honestly. Really? But go ahead. I, I agree with you. Well, with, your, you? with your own views, yes. <laughs> um, there, our, our responsibility uh, to community over Oh, that, I, no, that, I, I definitely, that, That's Sorry. what I was talking about. I don't know about it, I, I don't know where I'm going with integration anymore. I think I'm, I'm like Du Bois, I, I started <laughs> one way and I'm ending up another, but, um, yeah, so I, I guess you're talking about the work I did about choosing school for my own daughter? Absolutely. Okay. Um, for those who came a little later to my work, I, I was a journalist for many, many, many years before the 1619 Project, and most of my... Uh, work has been around the issue of housing and school segregation. So um, five years ago now, I guess, six, five, six years ago, I did. Um, I had written about school segregation for most of my career, and I had a very distinct way of thinking about schools. As, as uh, jaded as I am, I still believe that schools are our most democratic institution. I still believe in a public good. Our schools have never lived up to the potential, but uh, public schools are one of the last, if not the last places in our society where we still have most of the public 
interacts, engages, um, where you still have the potential to mix across social economic lines. There's very, very few spaces like that left, but nine out of 10 American children still attends a public school. And I do believe uh, very strongly in a common good, which I know I don't have to explain to people at a historically black college. Um, so I, I had started covering public schools as my very first job before I had kids, before I was even married, and I was covering segregated black schools. And I just remember all of the people I would meet, whether they be teachers in those schools, whether they be uh, professors, activists, uh, who were all saying they were working on behalf of these poor black kids, when you would ask them where they were sending their kids to school, they would never send their kids to school with the kids that they said they were acting on behalf of. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being so struck by what felt to me like a grave hypocrisy. How can you fight on behalf of kids that you're afraid to put your own kids around? So I told myself then that when I had a child, I wasn't going to make that decision. But of course, as we all know, it's easy to have values when you don't have to live them. So. <laughs> Um, when I had my daughter, we moved to New York City, which is uh, the most segregated large school district in the country. Um, and I, my husband and I intentionally moved into a low-income black neighborhood. And as soon as we moved there, we were one. My daughter was one when we moved there. Uh, Middle-class parents, and I don't care what race they were, white, black, uh, started saying, what are you going to do about her school? And I'm like, she's one. I I'm not even thinking about school. Um, and I'm an education reporter. And they said, no, you, you have to figure this out because you cannot send her to the neighborhood schools. Private school, you have to test her for uh, talented and gifted. They start testing, I don't know, oh, DC is like New York. Um, they start testing kids early here too, I think. They start testing kids at four years old in New York. Um, and they start test prepping kids at three years old, which tells you about how it really measures giftedness if you can test prep for it. Um, or you have to go to private school. And I just wasn't going to do it. And um, our schools are, in our neighborhood, are very segregated. They're very high poverty. And um, so I decided I was going to live our values. And if you live in a community, you should send your children to schools in the community. Um, I wasn't going to be afraid of, of our children. And then I had to tell my husband that this is what we were doing, which was an entirely different conversation. And, and it, it really got to, of course, uh, most of my work had been around what white people were doing to segregate our schools. But then this got also to what we were also doing, right? Middle class black folks. And that what had happened with integration was an abandonment of low-income black people by middle-class black people. And what was left behind were schools that not only were uniformly black, but they were un uniformly poor. And I got that tension. Um, if you're like me, and you're the first generation that could actually ensure your child gets the best, do you not do that? And that was the decision that we had to make. And my husband was a... Um, military brat. He grew up in uh, government, uh, U, uh, military schools. So he'd always gone to integrated schools. He'd always gone to well-resourced schools because these were the schools on the base. And now I was asking him to take a step back for his child because I believed it was the right thing to do. And um, we had many arguments about it and that fear that all parents have. Like you want the collective good, but you don't want to sacrifice your child. I kept hearing that again and again. And all I kept thinking is, well, whose kids do we sacrifice then? Right. Right. Who do we make that decision for? Why is my child worthy of something that other children aren't simply because I've been lucky enough to make a good living for myself and to have choices that I can exercise? And are we not called then to take whatever power, resources we've gotten um, and disperse them through the collective good? And so I took I told my husband, let's just go in the school because, well, many, I don't know, if y'all have kids, you might know. We judge these schools without ever going into them. We write schools off that are right in our neighborhood without stepping foot into the schools. 
And I took him into schools, and it was amazing what he saw. His kids were just sitting in the class having school, right? <laughs> I mean, it's elementary school. Right. And he, he left that building that day, and he was like, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed that I, I was scared to even put my daughter in the school. And so we made the decision. Uh, we put her in a 95% uh, free and reduced lunch, 93% black and Latino school. It was not easy. It was what we expected. Um, it took a lot of work, but um, my daughter got as much out of that experience. You know, we tend to think like, we're coming into a school like this and we're doing charity. Those babies are not our charity. Those babies have a lot to offer, and my daughter learned a lot from those kids, and I hope they learned something from her. But what we did do was we could change the balance of power in that school, because I tell you, when you're a New York Times reporter, and something's not happening in that school, and you go into that principal's office, she always takes your call. <laughs> it's funny, but she doesn't take the parents' calls, right? The parents who live across the street, in the, in the Farragut houses can be asking, because they would start coming to me, right? We've asked for this five times, and nothing happened. I asked for it once, and it happens. And I'm not even white. So imagine if I was white and at the New York Times, <laughs> right? So that's really what I'm calling us to do. I, I used to believe, really, when I started this journey on this book that I still haven't finished yet, how many academics know how that feels? Anybody? OK. <laughs> I don't know if this book will ever get done, but one day um, I, was, I was arguing for racial integration in schools, which I still think is necessary for the same reason it's always been necessary, as our kids have never gotten the resources they deserve when they're segregated. But I don't know that I'm arguing for that so much anymore. Um, I think what I'm arguing more for now is for us to come back into our own schools and us to come back into our own neighborhoods. And I know we're running out of time, it's supposed to be Q&A, but I'll just say this, and, and this is not, you know, I feel like me coming to Howard is just me completing the circle of the choices I've been trying to make about black neighborhoods and black schools for my daughter and black institutions. But when you, when you grow up in like working class black communities, we all know that when someone sees potential in you, in your community, they think that they are being positive when they say, go get your education and get out of here. Like that, we hear that all the time as a kid. And what that tells you is that your people are people you need to flee from. That success means you can't stay amongst your folks. And so we aspire to live in spaces and work in spaces where we're not wanted. And I'm, I, I just don't believe in that. And I'm, I haven't raised my daughter that way. Um, and I'm trying to say that success should be getting what you need from those institutions and then coming back and building your own. Absolutely. So that's why. But I know I'm, I'm just preaching to the choir at Howard. <laughs> it takes some of us longer than others to get there. Hi. Um, my name is Marissa Thornton, and um, I'm actually also from Waterloo, Iowa. What? <laughs> yes. So I'm very um, excited to be here and very proud. <laughs> um, what high school? Uh, Waterloo. Um, West High. Okay. The only, the only good one. Just playing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is, um, how has um, your upbringing in Waterloo, um, and your background informed your work? Uh, that's a great question. Um, my upbringing, I mean, I have Waterloo tattooed on my wrist for a reason. It, um, it shaped a lot about how I understood the world, um, the questions that I had that I, I've spent my life trying to answer. Um, in Waterloo, we, we didn't have a huge black population, though for Iowa, it's the largest um, black population in the state. It's about 15%, which is blacker than the nation, in a state that's less than 2% black. Um, so I always say we didn't have a lot of black folks, but we had enough to segregate us. 
and there was a black side of town, there were black neighborhoods, there were black schools. Um, and so we had a program called Open Enrollment, which was a voluntary school integration program, but it was only voluntary because if we didn't uh, start the voluntary program, the uh, Justice Department was going to sue the school district, and it allowed pa black parents to opt their kids into white schools, which is what my parents did. So from second grade to 12th grade, I rode the bus, and it was two hours every day to Kingsley, which as you know was the richest, whitest school, and the furthest from my house. And I remember when I was young, I didn't think a lot about it. Like, you just get on the bus and go to school. And all of a sudden, the bus ride started getting longer, and the kids looked different in my school. But as I got older, I really started to question, like, the white kids just walked home. And the black kids all rode up on a yellow bus, and at the end of the school day, we had to get back on that bus and go back to our own neighborhood with our own friends. And it was very clear that this was not our school. And I always say I started to really study the landscape of inequality through the school bus window. I started to look and wonder why when we started getting closer to the west side, um, which was the white side, why the houses started getting nicer, why they had places to shop, and the malls were over there, and all the restaurants were over there. Um, and they had nicer parks, it seemed like, and their roads got paved better. And I just really began to question that. And then, like I said, I would go home, and my family, you know, these, these were hardworking folks. These were folks who worked at meatpacking plants, the John Deere plant. Um, my uncles would come home after 10 hours at RATH or IBP, and their, their, their knuckles would be so swollen they couldn't even make a fist with their hands. And my uncle loved his house that he bought on contract because he couldn't get a loan but could never fix it up. And I was like, I knew that they liked nice things, that they worked hard, but they could not get ahead no matter what they did. And so it was all of those things of me really studying my environment and having questions um, that led me to the work that I do, absolutely. Is I, I knew that there were answers and I knew the answers that we were given were not sufficient. And I wanted to have, um, to study and to understand and then I also wanted to, I think I realized at a pretty young age the power of journalism, that the only place we appeared in the Waterloo Courier was in the police log. Mm. And I, I did say I was nerdy. I read the newspaper with my dad every day. I got my first letter to the editor published when I was 11 years old mm. by Jesse Jackson running in the 1988 primary. Um, and I knew that journalism could shape the reality, and I wanted to shape the reality. And if I had grown up in another community, I may have came out the exact same way, but I grew up where I came, and I know that that had a huge influence on the journalism that I would do. I said it was going to be speed round. That wasn't going to be better. I just have to tell you. Are you from Waterloo, too? We need you, we need you to say your name. I'm, and speak into the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. I am uh, Professor Janice Barry Edwards, and I went to UNI, uh, and the only place- I knew you place, had to be, have some connection. <laughs> the only place I was starved, I come from Philadelphia, that's where I grew up, and I thought I was in shock when I ended up in Cedar Falls, and mm. the only place that I could go to was Waterloo. Yes. I went to church there, I had friends there, I understand you so much better now. <laughs> I know the experience you went through and how it became the lens for what you do. So, what my I had to tell her who I was first. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and say, hey, because you're almost a homie. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I look at critical race theory, though, as a psychoanalyst to try to understand when we're working, when I'm working with patients, the embedded intrapsychic trauma of the experience. Yeah. Now that lens came from the trauma that I experienced when I went to UNI. And when I came here to Howard, I just fell on the ground and just cried. Mm. 
but I think it's really important as a framework to examine that trauma that is embedded in the psyche. Absolutely. Thank so you. Nice you. You too. What's going on? So um, my question is really quick. Um, out of curiosity, understanding how um, you've really just like blazed the trail for journalism and you've made like so many like, um, you've collected so many accolades and so many different things. What do you do for yourself? How do you take care of yourself? How do you like preserve your energy? What does self-preservation look like for you outside of all that? Hell if I know, I'm hoping y'all can help me <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always say drinking bourbon, but I realize that's actually not self-preservation. So, uh, I don't know. You know, it's a, it, and this will be a brief answer because I really don't have an answer. I think this is something uh, many of us who do this type of work struggle with, and particularly when you come from uh, humble means, it feels very luxurious to sit up here. I'm like, on my worst day, on my worst day. Um, I have no concept of what even my grandmother, who had a fourth grade education and was, grew up on a sharecropping farm, had to go through. So, like, how can I complain and feel like it, I, I don't know? I mean, I I I I know that it matters because my friends are also like, if you kill yourself, you're not going to be here to do the work. So I get that, but I, I, I the concept of self care is just very hard for me to grapple with because I just no, we've suffered so much and I'm not suffering, right? I mean, it's hard, but it, on my worst day, I don't know suffering compared to like what our ancestors have been through, so I, I just don't really know how to, somebody needs to give me some counseling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for that question. Good evening, my name is, Elijah Bratton, I'm a first year PhD student in the Higher Education Leadership and Policy Studies program. First of all, I do want to say, week one, I'm a teacher here in DC. Week one, in my AP government class, we analyzed your article, went through it in depth. This is how they were introduced to government this year. Wow, so they thank know you, you very well. And I unashamedly teach critical race theory in my class, tenant by tenant. So I'm not one of those who's saying, we're not teaching it. No, I actually am teaching it, and I'm very proud to be thank teaching you. it and my students are progressing greatly because of it, and your work was seminal to that. Um, my actual question is, in this era that we live in, um, some say globalized, there's all kinds of ways that we mark this era, but would you say that there's any room for a Garvey-esque vision of black self-sufficiency in the era that we live in today? Okay, say, say a little bit more, in what way? Um, in the ways that Garvey laid out for us, economic self-sufficiency, Almost, I mean, I don't want to say necessarily black utopias, but self-sustaining communities of progress and prosperity that aren't so dependent upon um, proximity to, to whiteness in order to gain benefits. Pretty much what, what Garvey laid out for us that inspired Malcolm X and inspired generations of um, leaders after him, is there any room for Garvey's vision for black America today? As in here or elsewhere? Here in the United States. Mm. That doesn't require us leaving. That, that, that may or may not require <laughs> us leaving. Like, let, let's just say for kicks, it doesn't require us leaving. Because it's sort of like Charles M. Blow, when he wrote um, his most recent book, The Devil, the, the Devil You Know, he, he makes this argument for us to all come back south and to build up the South, and that's where our political power, economic power. So in my vision, he, he almost was resurrecting a Garvey-like um, agenda for black America, and that's kind of where that question comes from. Um, so you said it was a quick question, but it's not a quick answer. Um, so I don't think it's possible. Let me just say that. Um, just practically speaking, because we have tried. We have tried again and again. I mean, you look at what, what happens after Reconstruction. Uh, black folks are not dying to live around white people. Black folks want to live on their own. And um, this, is, this was the quest for land, was to have independence. And we look all across the country where black communities have tried to set off on their own and they are starved of resources. Um, you can even look in a place like Michigan. Um, the government takes over their schools. If you want to see the most likely that your school be taken out of your hands via all black school in Michigan. 
um, be a black school, in, a black school, not school, school district in New Jersey. They won't run sewer out to you. Like there's all of these structural things that we see uh, when black people have tried to start our own communities. Um, the fact that we can't think of a place where it's worked long term is kind of the answer to the question. And this is, I mean, this is what, this is like the enduring struggle of being black in this country, is I don't think there's ever a good answer for us. Everything comes with, um, I mean, this is the difference between us and, and the countries in the Caribbean, right? We gain our freedom in a majority white country uh, where we're 13% of the population. And everything that we want at some point has to go through convincing enough of them, even our own independence, because you can't be completely independent um, in a white majority country. So I don't know what the answers are. Um, some people say leave. I personally am not willing to leave behind the vast majority of my uh, fellow black Americans who will never be able to afford to leave and go somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means by staying, we'll just always be fighting. We know that. We just always will. And frankly, you know, I, I Charles Bull is a colleague. Uh, simply having majorities in the South doesn't guarantee power. It never has. Mississippi was majority black. Mississippi was a lynching state in America. Um, you can look in the places now where uh, Florida, Texas, where they're either losing a white minority or don't have it, and what you see is a, is a minority takeover of power. You see extreme gerrymandering. You see, um, I mean, what is DeSantis passing? The anti-woke acts, they're passing uh, laws to make it harder for black people to vote. They're passing laws to ensure that even when um, Democrats win the majority, they don't win the majority in the legislature. So how do we do that? Simply having numbers is never ensured that we'll have power, which isn't to make us feel helpless, because I don't all want to argue that. But I feel like our, our fate in this country is what it's always been, is we'll always be fighting our own country and we'll always be having to resist and we won't find utopia here. Right. Which folks are, you know, I wish we had more time we could actually have a debate. Folks, folks are free to disagree and convince me otherwise. I'm, I'm Amy Billingsley. I'm retired government worker, I guess you'd say. Um, I grew up in Chicago in the 40s and 50s. And I, I really hate the fact that every time people talk about a segregated school, they, as, as, as though there's something wrong with it. Because my segregated elementary school in Chicago was wonderful. The teachers really cared about us. We had a lot of opportunities that my grandchildren that go to an integrated school don't have. And um, I just wonder, have you found that same thing, that the word segregation somehow is wrong? And yet I think that when we, when we have black community, it has a whole different feel for it. And that, that's, that's my thought. Anyone? Okay. Oh. I'm Annie Brown, and I'm a retired um, professor from the School of Social Work. Um, and I'd like to ask you what you think. I think that there's critical race theory, and there's the attack on critical race theory. And the attack is really don't teach American history. That this is what we are dealing with because the first thing they wanted to do was to take your material, your project out of the school. It's don't teach history because yeah. now anytime a person tries to teach American history that includes the experiences of all Americans, the specter of 
critical race theory will be raised. And because people really don't know what it is, it just has race in it, it becomes this uh, thing that you don't want your children to know. And it really is. You don't want them to know history. Yes. <laughs> I mean, let's be clear. The anti-critical race theory campaign is a propaganda campaign. We have to call it what it is. Um, these people are not opposing the teaching of critical race theory, but they do see it as, I mean, we actually can trace the beginning of it. There's a man named Chris Rufo. He tweeted about exactly what the strategy was, uh, was to put out this term um, and then put it in Americans' minds every time they hear this term, what it's saying. And what it's saying is, your country's racist, all these great white men weren't great, and you're responsible. Um, and it's been very effective. Like this, this was a propaganda tool. There's a, a great essay. Um, I'm reading a lot of historians and political scientists who are who study and write about fascism, who study and write about how democracies end. Um, and there's this great essay that uh, historian Timothy Snyder wrote in the New York Times Magazine, and he rightfully called these memory laws. And he showed how countries that began to slide towards authoritarianism began to pass these laws that restrict what you can teach about that country's history, that uh, force you to teach a patriotic history, a history that only glorifies uh, the powerful elite. And when you look in the laws, the laws are not saying you have to teach an accurate history. The laws are saying you can't teach our country was fundamentally racist. You can't teach our country, uh, you can't teach anything that's not patriotic, that does not glorify the founding. They're not calling for accurate history. Um, what they are trying to do is shape our collective understanding of America and to erase uh, things that would lead people to challenge power. So we should actually be very concerned. I, I, I've been trying to raise the alarm for this for more than a year now. People were very comfortable. Uh, even people who are normally free speech advocates when they were just banning the 1619 Project. I think because even uh, a lot of progressives are uncomfortable with the 1619 Project. But I said then, and it's coming clear now, they were never just going to stop at the 1619 Project. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, the don't say gay law, right? Uh, pulling books that are just about history, like Tennessee pulling the, the, book, the children's book that Ruby Bridges wrote about her own experience. Um, parents in Alabama charging Black History Month programming because they're calling it critical race theory. Uh, in Florida, right, Republicans say that they oppose big government, but Florida is passing a bill that will tell private companies that they can't have diversity trainings. So it was never going to be that small. And this is what happens when countries, I mean, people have been saying fascism, and I don't, I don't like to use hyperbole, but if you actually study how countries become fascist, we are seeing all of those things starting to line up. And memory laws are a key part of that. So you're right. Every time that we have responded back using the word critical race theory, we're actually furthering the propaganda. We're doing the work of propaganda for them. Um, I don't even call them anti-CRT laws. I just call them anti-history laws or anti-memory laws. We have to be shaping the language because, like Dr. King said, uh, those, who, um, those who wish us ill use time much more efficiently than those who wish us good. And we need to start using our time more efficiently. That's good. All right, that was it. <laughs> Hello. Oh, there you there go. We go. <laughs> so um, on behalf of the School of Social Work, um, I have the opportunity of closing this out um, this evening. And of course, we are definitely over time. <laughs> so um, I first want to just thank you for just taking the time on Valentine's Day for you know today to just sit and speak with us and participate in our intellectual sit-in. I also want to take a moment to thank Bizelle and um, Jalisa for facilitating um, my family over here. And on behalf of the School of Social Work, um, on behalf, I'm taking Dean Cruz's words here. We don't do flowers, we do books and gifts here. Oh, you know, yeah. they last longer. <laughs> so this is for you. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And I do want to now pass it off to Dean Whitaker to uh, do our closing. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. James. Thank you, everyone. What a wonderful conversation we've had tonight. And I know we're short on time, and I just want to make a couple of remarks, um, kind of in light of Valentine's Day, if you will. As you were talking, Professor Hannah Jones, I thought about when I was a young woman and I was in a pretty rocky relationship and I was kind of talking to a friend, a male friend, and I was like, what's going on? And he was like, Tracy, you need to know, before a man gets married, no offense to any men in here, this is what he told me, he said, a man is not trying to have his heart, his mind, and his body in the same place at the same time. That's what I said. And I felt like he had given me the code. He had given me the code. The men I was involved with wasn't falling short. He wasn't trying. That's what I think the 1619 Project has done for us. This mythology about America falling short is just that. It's mythology. It's not even trying. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about our path being that of resistance, that allows us to shift our position. Because when we think someone means us well and they don't, we fight differently. We fight with their perspective and their feelings in mind. And I thank you for giving us the code to understand that we can't just rely on our superhuman powers of resilience, but we will have to rely on our superhuman powers of resistance. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Frederick Douglass Day. <laughs> I like that. Keep